Okay, our next guest, Dr. Ben Solomon, how are you today? Uh, as I said, Dr. Solomon is a clinical director of the National Human Genome Research Institute at the U.S. National Institutes of Health. He previously worked at the Inova Translational Medicine Institute and GeneDx, a genetics genomics diagnostic company. He's also, since 2017, served as deputy editor-in-chief for the American Journal of Medical Genetics. His undergrad degree is from Brown and his medical degree is from Dartmouth. And I've asked Dr. Solomon to come talk about advances in AI when it comes to rare diseases research uh, and uh, diagnostics and therapeutics. Uh, we have him for uh, almost a full hour. We have him until 12 o'clock Eastern time US. And I wanna welcome you, Dr. Solomon and turn it over to you now. Great, thanks so much for having me, Chris. Um... As you can see, and as Chris mentioned, we're gonna talk about AI or artificial intelligence. We'll define a little bit about that. And uh, obviously for this, the sake of these sessions, we're gonna talk about it in the context of rare uh, diseases. So I, I don't know if you guys are familiar with um, Sarah Cooper. She, she gained uh, a fair bit of fame uh, in the last couple of years. She was one that did that kind of lip syncing or, or whatever it is to uh, our, our former president. Um, and uh, anyway, she has this calendar which having been in biotech for a while, I thought was uh, uh, was very apropos. I don't know if you guys, if a lot of this rings true, but I thought a lot of this uh, was amusing. And so this daily calendar, coincidentally, you know, just a, a couple weeks ago, this one came up where if you, you know, if you're trying to impress people and, and, and be smart, just mention something about artificial intelligence or machine learning, doesn't matter if you know what it means or not. Um, but, uh, you know, the point about this, I, although I think this is funny, you know, is, is that these ideas are, are pretty ubiquitous these days. We hear about them all the time in the context of healthcare and, and just about all parts of society. Um, just as, a, and as an example of that in rare disease genomics, so, you know, all of us go to tons of talks about various genetic and genomic-y things in rare diseases. Uh, a recent talk where this uh, guy that was studying rare eye conditions, so genetic conditions that affect vision and things like that, was presenting his pipeline. So the way he analyzes genetic and genomic data and you know, embedded in the pipeline are tools like this, which you know, are, are, are pretty much everybody's using these days, deep variant. So it's a, a, an artificial intelligence powered tool to look at genetic genomic data, just like the last speaker was, was talking about. And Google uh, was the one that came up with this one. This is just another tool that the folks at Illumina came up with. Illumina is the, the biggest sequencing company. So they make the, the machines that do the sequencing and they make other stuff too, like the chemicals. But, uh, but Illumina came up with this artificial intelligence tool to look at a specific type of, uh, of genetic change that can be important clinically. So the point is, you know, it doesn't matter whether that makes sense, I guess. But, but the point is that these things are embedded in, in a lot of the stuff that we do uh, those of us who are involved in clinical or research involvement of artificial intelligence, of rare diseases rather. So they're, they're already all around us, even if we might not be kind of aware what's under the hood. Uh, on the more, I guess, basic or translational side, um, one of the biggest articles that came out within the last couple of years, this, this came out just a, a month or two ago, was DeepMind, which is an artificial intelligence powered way to look at the way that proteins are shaped. So based on things like genetic information, be able to figure out, okay, what do these proteins look like and what are the important functional regions? Um, and uh, this is just a, a quote from someone that was working with that, with, with that group. And it's just, you know, one of these incredible things that for years and years, people have done this incredible painstaking work uh, in what's called crystallography to try to figure out the three-dimensional conformation of proteins. And all of a sudden these artificial intelligence tools come along, they do it so much faster and better. It's just this giant sea change People are talking about it like it's going to be as impactful as, as CRISPR, you know, like gene editing. I'm, I'm not sure about that, but it's a giant, giant, exciting big deal. Uh, there were two papers actually that came out about the same time with similar themes and methods. One was in Nature by, by uh, folks uh, AlphaFold, um, folks at DeepMind at Google, and then the other uh, at uh, from folks at UW, University of Washington, um, that were, whoops, I pop-ups coming up on my screen. Sorry if you see those. Um, from folks in my AI research group are, are, are chatting with each other in teams, sorry. Um, and then anyway, in science, this other one that did a similar thing, but looking at how different proteins interacted versus a single protein. And here's the, you know, just came out, uh, as you can see, less than a month ago, the, the cover of Nature, which is, you know, one of the preeminent journals uh, talking about this stuff. So a very, very big deal for rare diseases in lots of ways, because it lets us understand 
Why do people with these genetic changes have rare diseases? In other words, what's going on with the protein? And just as I heard someone asking about in the last session, okay, so now we know the cause, but how do we take it to the next level? How do we figure out how to treat these uh, patients, how to come up with new therapies and, and, and ways to actually make these people better, not just give them answers? Um, that's important by itself. I don't mean to disparage that, but of course we want to develop treatments. And a lot of that depends on understanding at a protein level what's going on. Um, Oops, let me go forward. So just some first definitions. There's tons of these pictures you'll see if you just do Google images on, on some of these things like artificial intelligence. A lot of them are, are kind of part of my language, kind of crappy the way they describe it, including, you know, this isn't the greatest one, but of all the ones I've seen, I think this is this is relatively reasonably encapsulates what we're talking about. So just to get some definitions and semantics out of the way, when we talk about AI, we, we're talking about as the name implies, these are computer programs that can kind of think like humans. That's why it's called artificial intelligence. And now I just want to point out that I, if, I, if I'm being pedantic, you know, they're not really thinking like humans. If you look at, if you look deeply, no pun intended about how they're working, but at least on a superficial level, there's some connections. And so, and we have lots of terms that we use like neural network that's supposed to connote that these things are working like the way a human mind works. So artificial intelligence isn't just one thing. There's lots of different types of artificial intelligence. Within artificial intelligence, one category of types is called machine learning. And so that's the idea, again, as the name implies, that the machine can learn from the information, sometimes by taking a really well-labeled data set, like a bunch of genetic data where it's all annotated and learning from that, and sometimes kind of self-teaching itself. So there's supervised and unsupervised learning and lots of different versions of that, as you can imagine. And then within that, there's something called deep learning, which is a lot of people are excited about these days, um, which is a type of machine learning. And as I'll show you, you know, it's using different layers. That's why it's called deep. So these different layers of the network. Um, this is just a cartoon that kind of explains deep learning or, or at least introduces it. So, uh, and I'm going to explain this really badly, but I'll do my best. So you have these filters, um, these kind of grids that are sliding across a picture and they're mathematically basically matching, you know, do I recognize that this is the edge of this picture? Do I recognize eventually as we get to more complicated layers, because it's, it's layers, that this is a headlight or a wheel, and then it connects those together. Is this a car or a truck or a van? You're giving kind of a mathematical vote to this. And then eventually specific things like, is this a Nissan or a Honda, or is this a new car or an old car or, or, or whatever? Um, and so you're getting increasingly complicated decisions. The math, I mean, it, it's really ingenious and clever. The math isn't that complicated. It's kind of math that most, I guess, middle school or early high school students could do, you know, a lot of adding and multiplying, um, but just it's so clever the way that it, uh, that it combines these data types. So here's another way that might be more familiar, another example. So, you know, early in the convolutional neural network here, early in the this this. Uh, neural network of layers, you know, we're recognizing dark and light and recognizing things like different edges. And then we combine some of those data. Now we, now the, the classifier, the program learns to recognize, okay, here's an eye, here's a nose, you know, here's this part of the face. And then it recognizes, okay, this is a face of a person. And then you can get deeper and say, okay, this is, you know, Ben's face or Chris's face, or this is the face of a person who probably has rare disease X, like Noonan syndrome, or rare disease Y, like Williams syndrome. And so we can start to recognize some of these stuff uh, really powerfully. And without, you know, needing a person like a geneticist like me saying, oh, I think it's this or that. And they actually outperform the geneticist a lot of the times in these cases. Um, so again, just to go back to this, this concept, I, I want to underline the fact that this isn't new. A lot of these things have been around for a while. Um, but there's reasons that you hear about them so much in the news now and, and in, in the scientific literature, reasons they're catching on. And I think there's, you know, I would say that there's maybe three main reasons. So reason one is we have these super powerful computers. This is BioWolf. I'm, I'm a, as you can tell, not the coolest guy. And so I'm kind of prone to geeky uh, jokes like this. But this is the name of the NIH High Performance Computing Cluster, BioWolf. And there's other ones throughout the world that are incredibly powerful, too. So number one, we have really powerful computers that we didn't have, you know, decades ago. Number two. People have spent zillions of person hours, you know, working out the architecture, meaning working out kind of how these different layers connect and all the different variables and things we call parameters and hyperparameters, all the different possibilities to get ones that work really well. Because mathematically or logically, 
the architecture, the way these things are built, isn't necessarily intuitive. So you just have to sometimes do a kind of a million monkeys approach. We're going to try all the possible things. So tons of people at tons of places like Google and Amazon and Facebook and NVIDIA you know, have tried all these different possibilities and say, okay, these ones work best. And it's not op often predictable which ones are going to work best. And you know, to their credit, they've made a lot of these architectures, a lot of these programs publicly available. So you can apply them pretty quickly to lots of different things in the biomedical sphere, including rare diseases. And then the last thing is that we have lots of data sets that we can use to train up different layers of the data set and then layer on top more specific things. And I'll, I'll give you examples of that. But this, for example, you can't really tell what this is, all these little squiggles or blobs. This is what was called the HAM 10,000. Now I think it's the HAM 30,000, I don't know. But it's this data set of lots of different pictures of different types of skin cancers and other, other skin conditions. And so if you're gonna build a neural net about skin conditions, you can use this to start in some of the, in some of the earlier layers. And then later on, you can get onto more specific things. Um, there's lots of data sets, or at least some really good data sets around facial images, which is a, a big thing for artificial intelligence for lots of reasons, including in rare diseases. One of the nice things, and this is a, a data set called Fairface, is that there's a lot more attention these days on data sets that are diverse, right? So that have diversity of ages, of races and ethnicities, of, of, you know, of, of anything you can imagine, or, or lots of things you can imagine. And that's really important because if you have a very biased data set to begin with, you are going to get biased answers and it may work much better for certain populations and others. And so you want to be really cognizant and careful about that. There's ways that one can try to address some of that. But the most important thing, at least in my opinion, this is just my opinion, all everything I'm saying. Um, so others may not agree, but is starting with a, a big diverse data set like this and really thinking about how you're how you're doing this carefully. So this is a nice article in, in case you guys um, aren't bored to tears by everything I say and want to learn more. Um, this was done by a, a group in, in, I think, mostly in Germany about a year ago. Uh, so they looked at, OK, where is machine learning? And remember, machine learning is part of artificial intelligence um, used in rare diseases. And um, when I say rare diseases, these are rare diseases. So, so a lot of them have genetic conditions or causes, rather. Some of them aren't what we think of as genetic. Maybe they're polygenic, like the last speaker spoke of. Maybe they're primarily environmental, but they're but they're rare. Um, and so just a couple things. I don't want to you know belabor all this, but I think to go into is, you know, you as you can see, there's lots of different methods used in panel A. In panel B, they're using different types of data, pictures, you know, images of faces or things like maybe x-rays. Um, Family history, medica medical information, omics means you know DNA and RNA and protein, other things like that. So different types of data. Mostly they're looking at diagnosis, as you can see, but there's also some in, in treatment. And I think everybody in the rare disease community, whether you're a researcher or a patient or a family member or a clinician, you know, wants there to be more information about treatment as well. But you first have to figure out what's causing it and biologically understanding it. So it does make sense that there's more in diagnosis, but we would love to see these bars shift over time. One of the neat things, as I mentioned, is that you can do work on rare diseases, even though the diseases by nature are rare. So, you know, building an, a neural network or so you can do these with about maybe 100 images per condition. Um, and they work pretty accurately, again, layered on some of these other uh, neural networks that have been pre-built or that you, one can pre-build using uh, data that's out there. This is just one example. This is from a, a buddy of mine here at NHGRI. He's a biochemical geneticist, meaning he studies and takes care of patients with what are called inborn errors of metabolism, like metabolic biochemical disorders. A lot of the conditions on newborn screening are biochemical conditions. So he was studying this rare genetic condition called propionic acidemia, which is a severe biochemical condition, can cause lots of different medical problems. And so he had this carefully arranged data set, spent a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, cleaning data, scrubbing data, collating data. And then he applied some of these uh, machine learning techniques. And the point of the slide is he was able to see some things, find some what we call novel biomarkers, so things we might see in the blood or, or urine or other bodily fluids um, that help us better understand you know, how healthy is this person? Is this person doing well or not? How severely affected is this person? What's the prognosis likely to be? So again, these are kind of newer techniques that let us better interrogate things and see things that manually, you know, just by looking at things in a spreadsheet or you know, reviewing a bunch of cases, a person wouldn't likely uh, pick up at all. So we're doing another review, just, just my little group um, on, on deep learning 
Um, and uh, just one thing I want to point out, we see a lot of the same trends here. Deep learning is a subset of machine learning. Um, so some, a lot of diagnosis and then a little bit starting to go into, you know, what, how do we discover drugs and, and figure out treatments um, for these patients. One example of that, just to show you a picture is, you know, we can use artificial intelligence to sort all the different possible compounds and molecules um, that might be able to address a, a genetic condition or rare condition. So by short, just basically on shapes and biochemical properties of these molecules, are there things that are more likely uh, to be used as treatments um, and sort of select things that can go on for further testing. So a really exciting way that hopefully we can find more treatments for, for these folks. Um, as you can imagine, a lot of this work is being done in the United States, but a lot of it's being done in other countries as well. Um, one thing that I put this up here to show isn't where it's being done, but to remind me to make the point that even though I'll, this is what's showing you what's shown in terms of publications, there's tons of this going on that's not published. So lots of biotech companies, because they might not care as much about publications. They want to, you know, get a therapeutic out there or, or get, get a new test out there. So they're not really going to publish their stuff for a variety of reasons. So the point is that even though we see, you know, hundreds to thousands of, of articles even recently on this, you know, this is just the tip of the iceberg about what's, what's going on out there. I'm going to briefly mention this, but it's important. So the fact that I'm not spending a ton of time on this, I don't want to imply that it's not important because it's a big deal. But the point is, is that there's lots of talk and growing talk, as you can see, this is from Stat News just a month or so ago about needing to regulate these, uh, these AI approaches. And this goes for rare diseases and common diseases as well. There's an example that you know comes up all the time in this context of Epic, which is an electronic health record. Um, I may be telling this incorrectly, so um, don't quote me on this. I guess I should say, um, but algorithms like uh, from certain companies that are embedded into electronic medical record systems or others um, weren't working well, um, or had biases or things like that. Um, and because of some well-known examples of this and other examples, you know, there's been some interesting proposals about how do we regulate uh, this industry? It's going to be a big deal. Um, and we want to make sure it goes forward well and carefully. Um, I just thought one interesting thing, and this was published about uh, a little less than a year ago, um, this, this article about it anyway, was this idea about putting labels on our algorithms, kind of like we have labels on nutrition saying, okay, when was this, you know, validated, approved? How is this validated? How well does it work to make it um, clear and transparent? Because um, it can be, there can be, as I'll talk about later, a lot of black box aspects to this that can be problematic for a number of reasons. Um, just to give you some more examples. So this is just a, a little paper that, that our group did that we published uh, just very recently. Um, where we looked at different genetic skin conditions. Um, and these are just pictures of examples. And we wanted to look at, okay, you know, these nicely zoomed in pictures, but also, you know, the kind of picture a mom or a dad might take of their, their kid or a patient might take of themselves of this skin finding and, you know, bring to their doctor or text to their friend and say, you know, what do you think this is? You know, could this be this genetic condition or that genetic condition? Some to a geneticist would be relatively easy to pick out. But often they're pretty hard and it's hard to tell one from the other. And for folks that aren't geneticists and there's, you know, very, very few geneticists in the world, um, you know, like a pediatrician, these are these are even harder to recognize. Um, I won't go into this too much, but the, the bottom line is that our our classifier, that would be the red line, our, our artificial intelligence algorithm, our deep learning algorithm outperformed both pediatricians on different types of images and overall geneticists as well. This is not to imply that um, this is kind of a fair context, co a contest rather. You know, a, a clinician when they're looking at pictures are also going to take into account other information, like what's the family history? Does this person have uh, intellectual disability? Does it, do they have other findings that help them narrow in on the on the possibilities? But maybe this can be a way to help triage folks, or especially in in parts of the world or parts of our country where there aren't lots of specialists. Could this be a way to help decide, okay, let's get this patient to a subspecialist earlier than that patient and just to help um, with some of those things. And so we're, we're starting to think about next steps. How do we, how do we test whether or not this is works? Oh, and sorry, this is just a, sorry, this is just a, um, what's called a confusion matrix where you look, where you can kind of zoom in and see where does the algorithm versus the, the clinicians do well and not well. For the sake of time, I'm going to skip this. 
The point though that I think is important is that some of these things work really well and impressively on paper, but in real life, um, you gotta test what we call the implementation science. So I'll just tell you a couple examples of this and hopefully I'm not um, mangling words or explaining things wrong, but this is per my understanding, but there's this example shown here where they used a, a digital artificial intelligence assistant to try to help a pathologist better figure out if someone had liver cancer or not based on the, the biopsy. Um, and one thing they found was that even though the artificial intelligence was mostly really accurate, you know, it occasionally would make mistakes. And the problem was, is that often the pathologist would defer to the, um, to the artificial intelligence uh, tool. So they would be kind of, I, I don't know, my interpretation, and this is just me, you know, would be that they were maybe intimidated by it. They didn't want to contradict it. So even though if they had looked at it by itself, they might have given a different diagnosis or answer, they tended to perhaps over defer to the artificial intelligence assistant. Another example, and there's, and, and uh, I have the citations or things if you want to look up this later, because uh, hopefully I won't, I won't misremember or explain it badly, but there was a, a nice tool artificial intelligence based tool to diagnose, I believe it was diabetic retinopathy. So problems with the eye you can have when you have uh, diabetes. Um, and they were using this artificial intelligence tool, which was, as the title says, you know, really, really accurate. Um, but the problem is it didn't actually help get patients earlier or better uh, to specialists or get treatment um, just because they kind of plopped it into the workflow per my interpretation. So there has to be a lot of implementation to figure out, okay, we have these intelligent tools they're really accurate, they beat clinicians, um, but how do we implement them so they actually help the clinicians and the patients in a way that makes the outcomes uh, better? And so anyway, this is just kind of a dopey cartoon, but the idea is that you know it's great that these things are faster and, and often more accurate, um, but you gotta make them work and you gotta make them work for everybody involved. Uh, again, I just wanna highlight this because I think it is really, really critical is the importance of diversity. So going back to uh, specifically to rare diseases, these are pictures of people's faces and hands with a rare genetic condition called rubenstein tabey condition. Um, and uh, researchers use this tool, which is a terrific tool that helps based on facial photographs, um, helps us diagnose, does someone have this genetic condition or that genetic condition? For disclosures, I used to be um, on the, the scientific advisory board. I used to be on the board of this, of this group. Um, uh, and I'm no longer for a couple of years, but I, I know a little bit about what's under the hood and I know the guys that are doing this. So that's why I'm using this example. Um, but the point of this, as this article showed, and this is uh, a physician from, named, named Cedric. Um, Cedric uh, works with my research group now, and he did this paper a couple of years ago before he joined my research group, but it showed, and that's why this red square is there, that this tool works really well but it doesn't work nearly as well for folks of African ancestry versus folks of other ancestries. Um, primarily, by my interpretation, they didn't have as much data from folks of African ancestry. So Cedric and I and others are working hard to get the databases more diverse and, and so that they'll help more people and not just folks of certain populations. Um, another issue, and I don't want you to think that I'm being a, a naysayer, being negative, but I want to be kind of transparent about a lot of uh, the challenges and, and what folks like myself and others are working on, is this kind of this black box concept that I that I introduced um, a little bit earlier. Um, well, sorry, let me get a drink real quick because my voice is getting dry. Um, and so just as an example of this, this was a paper that came out um, several months ago in, in, in Nature. Um, and I, I guess a talk can't go by, unfortunately, without us talking or thinking about the pandemic in some ways. So sorry, I know it's nice to escape that. But this article showed that all these artificial intelligence tools that were said to be really accurate at diagnosing COVID um, and quickly from things like an X-ray or a CT scan or things like that, they were actually looking at these artificial intelligence tools as this picture is showing you, they're looking at the wrong things. So they're looking at things as these arrows are showing you these red dots means the classifier, the artificial intelligence algorithm is mostly weighing or choosing which pixels to look at or, or the pixels that are making its decision are mostly these ones that are outside of the lung fields. These red boxes correspond to this, right? To these x-rays. And so you can see out here, it's not even in the lung field. So it's really good at diagnosing COVID or figuring out who is COVID or not, but it's doing little tricks like, like figuring out, okay, everybody with COVID, 
you know, maybe has a the, the label on their on their what do you call it their patient ID a certain way, or maybe they have a certain line here, or maybe their shoulders a certain way. Um, so they're getting it right, but they're finding um, they're doing it for the wrong reasons. Maybe another example, just to simplify things, would be. Let's say I want to diagnose a rare disease based on x-rays. And so I send 100 x-rays of people with a rare disease that were all taken at my hospital. And I compare those to 100 other x-rays um, that my buddy that works at a different hospital, you know, just general x-rays um, has, or maybe, you know, ones I just pull off the internet, a bunch of normal x-rays. So the classifier, the artificial intelligence would probably, you know, or, or could get really good at differentiating those two. But it might just be learning to recognize, oh, yeah, these are what x-rays look like when they come from Ben's hospital. You know, not necessarily these are the characteristics of this rare disease that lets me figure it out. So you have to be careful about that. And, and we and others are, are looking at this. So this is, you know, we call these attribution maps or saliency maps. And these are just pictures going back to these rare genetic skin conditions as examples where, where you see a, a dot. It means that that's an important pixel that our classifier, our artificial intelligence tool is using to make the decision. So these are different types of skin conditions. Um, I don't wanna get boring, but I, I can't help it. But you see these interesting different patterns depending on the shape, see like either the rim of it or the, you know, more of the entire skin finding. Um, and then we get more complex pictures like this person showing their skin here in their hand. And you can see it's still doing a pretty good job looking at mostly at the skin lesion, it's starting to look a little bit at the, at the hand, but you know, still doing a pretty good job. Um, and then we tested on more complex pictures, like here's a, a mom um, holding her baby and the baby has these skin findings that lets us make the diagnosis. Here's someone with a more advanced version or an older person of the same condition. So you get other things like you get these kind of bumps on the skin, you have the arm, you have the breasts, and you can see that you know it, it is in a, in a good way, mostly looking at the right things but it's getting distracted by some things to a certain extent, you know, even including the border of the belly uh, and things like that. And then, you know, another example, Gorbachev. And uh, I think in some other presentation, I have lots of different pictures of, you know, doing different iterations. We can get it to focus more and more on the birthmark that Gorbachev has rather than say just his eyes or this light in the background. Um, one funny thing, when we recently hired, you know, a, a computer scientist to work with our group for a couple of years, another one, um, and uh, we were showing them, uh, you know, these are mostly young folks just out of college, you know, really smart, smart, super smart people. So we were showing them these, these pictures of Gorbachev to explain kind of how our methods had developed. And, uh, and none of them recognized Gorbachev. So it made me feel old, but it was really interesting. Anyway, um, these are pictures of the eye. So these are people with rare genetic conditions that affect the eye. Um, and when one of these patients or families goes in to see an, uh, an eye doctor or like my buddy Rob here at NHGRI, uh, an eye geneticist, um, the question they're asking is, okay, look in my kid's eyes. Um, will they be able to ride a bike someday? Will they be able to drive or they, will, they be, will their vision be so poor that they won't be able to? So we're testing some techniques to see if, you know, can we better predict that or, or be better able to diagnose these folks uh, with these types of conditions. Um, and this is just kind of this, what we call an attribution or saliency map, just looking at the eyes, these retinal images, seeing, are we looking at the right place? Can we categorize it um, among the different um, types of eye conditions pretty well? And shifting gears a little bit, I just want to talk about just another example of a different type of artificial intelligence. These are called GANs or generative adversarial networks. And so you've probably heard of deep fakes, you know, how they make Mark Zuckerberg or Nancy Pelosi you know, look like they're saying something that's not real, you know, so there's these are a different type of technology. Um, and so I, I'm not going to comment on some of the um, the social aspects of this too much, but uh, you know we can use the same techniques, and I'll show you why these can help with rare diseases to generate fake images of people with uh, or, or, or findings having to do with rare diseases. So these are fake images on the top. This is all neurofibromatosis type 1, a rare genetic skin condition. Here's another rare genetic condition called Mecuna Albright syndrome. And you can see the computers generating pretty accurate um, pictures that a dermatologist wouldn't be able to tell this is real or not real. They would say, oh yeah, that looks like a, a real patient. Um, the other thing we can do with this is that we can ask the computer say, okay, if we start with a picture here, you know, predict the prognosis. Um, you know, what is this going to look like over time? So this is someone's back with neurofibromatosis type one. And as they're aging or different people, 
Um, you can see it developing. What's neat, or one of the things that's neat is, you know, it's all, it's not only is it drawing the skin findings, it's drawing things like the shoulder blades and the, you know, the spine here. So it's, it's doing all, all that kind of stuff too, which is, I think is kind of, kind of neat. And this is also ways, you know, so we can perhaps more accurately for someone being treated for a condition or rare disease, you know, we can look at the images and maybe more accurately uh, predict what the prognosis is going to be again, or maybe how a person will react to a certain medication. So lots of uses of these, of these GANs, these generative adversarial networks. Um, I won't kind of belabor how they work for the sake of time, but you can, it's kind of cool. You have two different neural networks competing, one that's making the picture and then one that's discriminating. So they're generative. It generates data adversarially of these two networks fighting because if the fake one, if the, the one that the generator rather, if it gets too good, then the discriminator can't tell if it's real or not. So they're kind of fighting for to be to be the best there. Um, and then it's a network. So you have these two interacting networks. These are just some fake eye images of, of people with different uh, genetic eye conditions. And again, an ophthalmologist can't tell if these are, are real or not. So they're very, very accurate. Um, this is a, a condition called Williams syndrome. Uh, I gave a, a grand rounds at University of Chicago or Northwestern University, sorry, <laughs> yesterday um, uh, for a, a geneticist uh, department there. And, you know, they, they can't really tell which ones are real, real patients with Williams syndrome, and which are ones that are fake that we generated. These are the fake ones, uh, by the way. Um, this is These are all fake images. This is from a New York Times article that came out, I think, within the last year or so. These are all fake images. You can see they're much more, uh, what do you call it, high resolution because they're, uh, you know, if you use many more pictures, we only had a few hundred pictures here. But if you have many more pictures, you can get really high resolution pictures, which are just remarkable. There's some things that, you know, if you know what you're looking for, you can tell which ones are fake or not, maybe, but they're really darn subtle. Like in these, you know, sometimes if you see someone with earrings, they might not match, you know, so some symmetry things it can't quite get right. Sometimes hair it has trouble with. Um, like just kind of funky things we wouldn't necessarily expect from the hair. And then maybe this guy's not a good example, but you can see little differences maybe in the uh, in the arms of the glasses, you know, so but but they look really darn real. Um, so there are ways that, you know, we and others are, are trying to use them to make our classifiers, make our artificial intelligence diagnostic tools better. So this was just an example of, you know, making lots of x-rays of people with broken limbs might help artificial intelligence better figure out if someone has a broken limb or not. It didn't really work in this and a couple other articles. Um, what we found that is if you start with a relatively small or slightly messy data set, um, like honestly, we off, often have to deal with with rare diseases because you know the data sets are small. These can actually augment things. And there's some other clever tricks that some folks in our group, I work with this brilliant computer scientist named Dat Duong, who's just doing beautiful stuff in this area. So some very clever tricks to, to for rare diseases to make things a little more accurate. And you have to use these tricks because again, the data sets uh, tend to be pretty small. Um, and again, you know, so this is, these are just fake pictures, but this is someone with Williams syndrome, a child showing um, uh, how they might age and what the, what the face looks like uh, when these kids are older. And, you know, partly it looks like a party trick, but it's also really important because in rare diseases, we often find that a lot of us, including myself, to be honest, we tend to focus on pediatric care. So folks might get diagnosed these days in the pediatric uh, time frame, but if they miss that window or they're already older, there aren't nearly as many um, people in the adult medicine world who are familiar with rare diseases. So hopefully these tools can help uh, get, get these folks diagnosed better um, as they're older too. Uh, and then we're exploring, again, I won't belabor this uh, just so we can move quickly through this, but we're exploring you know, these attribution methods, what part of the face is important in, these are just a couple different examples of genetic conditions. These look fuzzy because they're a composite of different uh, GAN images um, that, we're, that we're looking at and playing with. And we're doing things like, we're starting to do a project where you look at these pictures, see what the computer looks at, and then bring in a doctor to look at a picture um, of the face and see what they look at, you know, including expert geneticists and, and things like that. Anyway, lots of fun things, I think, and interesting things to explore. Um, I'm almost done here. Hopefully I'll, I'll leave enough time if there are questions or just to give you guys a break from, from me. Uh, this is a terrific book that came out in 2019 all about how does artificial intelligence, how will, how can it, how might it help healthcare? Um, and, you know, I think it addresses this question that's on a lot of folks' minds uh, in this area. Is, is this, is this computer going to take my job? Um, 
it's interesting. I, I really like this book. Uh, I actually, I bought it for everybody in my research group to read, to help them think about applications and, and, and kind of the, the overall effects of this stuff. Um, it's already a little bit dated, you know, it came out in 2019. The field's moving so quickly that it already feels a little bit out of date, but still a, a great book. So I'll say thanks to all of you guys. Um, thanks to Chris, thanks to the organizers. And these are a few folks in my group and the few of the folks that we, uh, um, that we started to collaborate with. I should, I should, I guess, mention by way of disclosure, I came back to NHGRI only about two years ago and I established this research group, which is one of the hats I wear um, only about a year or so ago. So we're still kind of brand new, but I think doing kind of fun and interesting and hopefully uh, stuff that will help a lot of people. So with that, I will stop sharing. And if there are questions, I'm happy to, to respond to any. Yes, th thanks for that wonderful overview. I just, uh, we do have some questions coming in. Um, and if you fellows or, or viewers, if you have a question, put those into the, the event Q&A and, and they'll get forwarded to me. But could you talk a little bit about the, you know, the going forward, what's the real practical impact of this? I mean, very basically, you know, when does the doctor become irrelevant? And, you know, 10 years from now, if you have some weird bug that you can't figure out, would you rather be diagnosed by your local, your local primary care doctor or or diagnosed by a machine? Who, who do you think would have more confidence in? Yeah, no, it's a really great and important question. Can you see me, by the way, Chris, rather than my yes. screen now? Okay, so I may yes. have to click the right thing. It's good. So my response to that is that my hope, and hopefully this will happen, is that it won't feel like either you go to the doctor or either you go to the computer, the machine. What I'm hoping is that these will become useful and very used tools to help your doctor and other clinicians diagnose you better, figure out better treatments better. And so the doctor, I don't know if you've been to the doctor lately, but if you go, a lot of times the doctors, you know, not looking at you, they're just looking at their computer, they're typing, they're, you know, documenting, they're, you know, we've lost so much of the human interaction. So hopefully maybe these computers could listen to the conversation, or I know that sounds creepy, but maybe, you know, make notes of the conversation, or they could, the, the phone could look at this skin lesion that you have that you're worried about might be melanoma, or a mom might be worried that their kid has a rare disease. And so it'll let the doctor talk to you more, interact with you more, explain things more, rather than just you go to a computer and it's like the Jetsons. You know, that's my that's right. my real hope. My worry, to be very honest, though, is that this would be yet another tool. And I'm going to sorry, I'm going to say something controversial here that will get in the hands of hospital administrators and say, OK, doctor, you're seeing a patient every 15 minutes. Hey, you have these great tools. Now, guess what? You need to see a, doc a patient every five minutes. It makes it even worse, you know, but. My hope is that it'll help people make better, quicker, more accurate diagnoses and leave more time for the human kind of Norman Rockwell interactions that, you know, a lot of us went into medicine wanting. I mean, does that mean that, I mean, if, if by definition you're, you're going to be using the machine, the machine learning or the AI, the computer for some diagnosis, for reading images, for uh, doing essentially some of the diagnostic work, does that mean... The, the need for the doctor is still there, but is going, there are going to be less needs for the doctors. And what does the AMA think of all of this? Yeah, so there's there's lots of different opinions on this. Um, it's going to have impact. My opinion, again, is that it's going to have impact. Um, and you, having looked at a lot of the arguments both ways on certain areas more than others. So I think Eric Tobel, I can't remember what term he uses, but you know the, the pattern recognizers, the radiologists, ophthalmologists, dermatologists, Hopefully, they'll have much better, more accurate tools in their hands. And, you know, as is given in the book, maybe the radiologist, instead of sitting in a dark room the whole time, maybe the radiologist will be able to go talk a patient through what their exam is going to be like and actually go, and which doesn't happen now, and go and talk to the patient about what their results show. You know, that's what I'm that's what I'm really hopeful for. And medicine will get much less compartmentalized. I think you're right, Chris, though. It's a very, it's a very smart point. You know, there is nervousness and worry including that maybe, you know, we'll just go algorithm crazy. We won't know what these algorithms mean. They won't be regulated. There'll be some problems with them and they're going to set us back. But I think if we proceed in a smart and careful way, they can really, really help medicine. The other point I want to make is that there, you know, there's such healthcare disparities both here in the U.S. and throughout the world. So, you know, if you happen to have the luxury of living near an academic medical center, awesome. You might get to a subspecialist who might be a real expert in rare diseases. But if you live in a pretty rural place and a lot of the middle of the country, I don't mean to slam the middle of the country, but, you know, just not near the coasts. Or if you live in another country, you know, you're not going to have access to these things, to these experts. Um, you know, it's hard to know who to email just to say, hey, I think I might have this condition. Who do I uh, 
Who should I see? So a lot of these tools technologically and the connectivity can really help jumpstart things kind of in the way, you know, I heard the example of, you know, in, in other countries, um, a lot of them have cell phones now, which is super helpful, right, for lots of reasons, but they didn't just go lay landlines down in all these other countries. Um, they just skip things, you know, so maybe this will allow people to to leapfrog and to make diagnoses in places where they don't have access to a lot of these experts. That was kind of a rambling answer, but hopefully at least that gives a, a, a flavor of things. Okay. So uh, one very specific question. You had several a handful of slides there dealing with Williams syndrome. What, what is that exactly? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So I just gave a lot of examples without providing much context. So Williams is a, a, a rel I mean, all rare things are rare, but in the rare thing, it's a relatively common condition. So any geneticist, most pediatricians will know Williams syndrome. Williams syndrome is a condition that has to do with a chunk of one of the chromosomes being missing. So this chunk contains a number of different genes, and these genes have to do with why the folks have differences in, in things like certain electrolytes in their blood, um, sometimes a characteristic facial appearance that a geneticist might recognize. They often have intellectual disability. They have interesting some, you know, some strengths that that that's that are well known. For example, a lot of musicality, and they tend to be very social and outgoing. Um, and uh, Williams syndrome is it's it's a good one to study because it's rare enough that there hasn't been enough work in the area, um, but it's common enough that one can collect enough data and everybody will have heard of it. Um, so it's kind of one of those middle ground rare conditions. It's what we call a, chroma, a cytogenomic condition because it again has to do with a a chunk of a certain chromosome uh, being missing. Okay, the um, we've been talking here about the use of AI in in the context of rare diseases. I mean, obviously, it can also be used in the context of non-rare diseases. And are the are, are the advances in the non-rare side are they just as much or accelerating faster than they are on the rare side? I mean, how? Yeah, it's it's a great question. Um, it's very different because rare and common conditions are different, though there, of course, there's lots of overlaps. So with common conditions, um, the great advantage is that you have much more data, right? Because it's more common in it. And that if there are services that collect the data and have data that's accurate, you can do really powerful things with it. So one example, the UK uh, Genome Project, I can't remember the exact title, you know, they're sequencing lots of people, collecting lots of data about lots of people. And there's been some really nice statistical and some artificial intelligence work on lots of common diseases because of that. Um, and because you can get enough data a little more easily, there's been more work, as you would suspect, on common diseases. The nice thing about rare diseases though, and this again, maybe this is my, my bias or, or one of the reasons that I like rare diseases is that complex diseases, common diseases like asthma, most forms of diabetes mellitus, obesity, aging, it's really hard to understand the biology because the biology is so multifactorial. You know, it's some genetic factors, some environmental factors, some epigenetic factors, some, you know, just whole mix. So, Understanding the biology of it is really hard and understanding the, the treatment of it is really hard. Rare diseases can be terrific because sometimes, I don't want to imply that the biology is simpler, but there might be one genetic change that's really causing this. So we can narrow in on this, really understand the biology, and then really start to understand some of the therapeutics around it. The wonderful thing about that is that this can often be a window to treating more common diseases. So one, um, I guess, high profile example that I might give, there's been, there's a, a Francis Collins, who's the head of the NIH, does lots of things. One of the things he does is he studies a very rare condition called progeria. And it's this condition, you guys, if you Google it, you'll probably recognize some of the images. Um, these kids, these patients, these people with it, they age, They look like they age really, really quickly. And they basically do age really, really quickly. So they figured out the cause of it, Francis and his group. And there's a new paper that came out. Um, they're looking at, or several new papers, looking at different therapeutics, including things like gene editing or gene therapy for it. So a lot of excitement around caring for that disease, but perhaps just as importantly, a window, um, not as importantly for those people, but for other people, a window into aging and how as a, a healthcare system, we can biologically understand and manage aging. Okay. So I have some uh, questions from our fellows coming in. Uh, this is from Aaron Pratter, of the, a fellow from the Gazette in Colorado Springs, Colorado in the US. Can AI help diagnose patients with polygenic conditions via facial phenotype recognition? And how common is it for multiple patients to have the same polygenic condition? Yeah, so it's a, it's a very good question. It's a very hard answer because the bottom line is we don't know, right? So if you take, let's say a cohort of Everybody with rare diseases, we might only know the answer and you sequence them, you sequence them up the wazoo, you do genomes and exomes and 
aren't transcriptomes. We get answers depending on where you look, but let's call it about 30%, right, of the time. So the rest of the 70%, you know, that means that either the answer is not in an obvious place, or maybe it is polygenic, multifactorial, not just polygenic, but maybe it's, you know, different gene changes and different non-genetic factors that are interacting together. So the 70% of those or so, or maybe it's just part of the genome that we're just not good at looking at yet. Um, so it's a, it's a tough question, but one can recognize clinically, for example, from some of the facial recognition, one can recognize clinically um, in what we would call polygenic or multifactorial conditions as well. For example, there are some rare diseases where we don't know the cause yet. You know, we suspect it might be a simple Mendelian cause, but we don't know. It might not be. And we can still apply some of these same tools like the facial recognition to some of these multifactorial conditions. But I want to say you have to be really careful about things that are defined clinically or, or by their entities because they may seem on the surface like they're similar. But when we actually find the causes, maybe it turns out that, oh, yeah, a few people here have clear genetic causes, single monogenic Mendelian genetic causes. Here, these people are polygenic. Let's call them polygenic. Here, let's say these people are multifactorial. So we have all these, you know, older definitions about what causes things. And we don't know yet enough about the causes yet. So it's hard to know or understand why it would work well with certain groups than others. Um, but these techniques can work. Um, uh, I don't, it was at Lisa who asked the question. These techniques can work in different ways around lots of different um, conditions, whether they're simple or polygenic. Um, you just have to make sure that the algorithms you're using are being used correctly for the questions that you're asking. Okay. So next question from health reporter Karen Weintraub of USA Today. Are you or others using this approach to analyze FDA-approved drugs to see if they might have off-label benefits for people with rare diseases? So I'm not, yeah, it's a, it's a really good and important question. So I'm not personally doing that. Um, my, my little research group is working on other areas, but there are certainly people, um, I can't give you any names or reference papers, but if you email me or contact me at some point, I can point you to some references that are certainly doing exactly that. So they're, you know, screening these giant compound libraries using lots of different techniques, including artificial intelligence techniques to figure out, you know, even if this is FDA approved or maybe some brand new molecule, you know, would this work for a, for a known condition? Yeah, that's, that's a very active thing that's being done um, in lots of ways. Um, it's challenging, as you can imagine. But yeah, that's something that people are directly applying these tools to. Okay, next question from David Wahlberg of the Wisconsin State Journal, a fellow of ours from the U.S. How much are electronic medical record companies like Epic getting involved in this? Yeah, so the, my easy answer is I don't know. Um, because they tend to keep, I mean, for a variety of reasons, maybe I'm just not smart enough, but they tend to keep things for reasons that one might guess uh, relatively close to the vest, um, you know, for all the reasons that, that, that they might want to. Um, they are certainly working lots on different algorithmic approaches. In terms of what's under the hood, um, it's hard for me to respond because I, you know, for a lot of it, I don't know. Um, but there are many in Epic, I am sure, and in other equivalent companies, as well as academics and other researchers that work with Epic and other EMRs that are exploring these. For example, some of my colleagues up at Columbia, um, Columbia in New York, um, did I thought a really neat paper and other folks at Vanderbilt have done some neat stuff too, where they tried to pull stuff out of the electronic record to much more accurately and quickly figure out, okay, who might have a genetic condition or, or sequelae of a genetic condition. There's some really beautiful papers on that. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard of the the uh, All of Us study, the the study. It's it's an NIH study mm -hmm. where they sequence lots of people and try to understand lots about their genetic and other environmental healthcare impacts. The head of it now, the CEO of it, Josh Denny, he used to be at Vanderbilt, and he he was a senior author or first author, I think senior author, on a beautiful paper in science a few years back that did exactly that. They looked at the EMR and using some of these natural language processing and other techniques, pulled data out of there uh, in a way that would enable folks to diagnose people better, people that would have otherwise been overlooked. But it's really hard. It's so much easier said than done because EMRs, you know, it's, this is always said, and so I know this is a cliche, but I'm going to say it again, they were not designed for this, right? They were designed for billing. And so one can kind of get them to work in this way, but that's not their primary purpose. I went on and on about that, but it's a, it's a great topic and something I honestly didn't cover uh, too much in the talk. Okay. So a couple of questions from Aaron Prater at the Gazette in Colorado Springs again. And and this will probably be the last two questions, but fellows, we have uh, Dr. Solomon with 
uh, for another Q&A session later this afternoon where small group, you can uh, really spend some time with him uh, getting into the details on these issues. But this question from Aaron, the length of the average diagnostic odyssey for a rare disease patient is something like seven years. How much time could AI shave off that number? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and you see that statistic a lot. So um, I can't give you a universal answer. Like it'll become this or that, but I'll give you some examples. So you guys are probably aware, and I'm sure someone in this talk has cited uh, Stephen Kingsmore's work. Uh, he's at Rady Children's University of California, San Diego. So he's done these things, Guinness Book of World Records, where they've had a baby who's been sick in the NICU, a very sick patient. And within 24 hours, I can't remember what the exact record is. It's well under 24 hours now. They've been able to get a sample from the baby. And I believe with the parents sequence the baby and using a combination of artificial intelligence and traditional tools, find an answer within 12 hours, which is crazy, right? And these are relatively low hanging fruit, I should say, because you know these people haven't been through the diagnostic odyssey. They're more likely than others because they're very sick as a baby and they have certain characteristics of having one of these conditions. But you can imagine that theoretically, if Dr. Kingsmore and his colleagues and others who do this type of work could do this type of work on everybody that might have a genetic condition, you could diagnose a ton of people really, really, really quickly. One thing that I'll mention, which is I think just neat, is that because of the, I think the really exciting evidence, there's starting to be more insurance coverage for that. So I believe it's Michigan just up uh, has, uh, I want to say I'm going to twist this, so Google it and, and get it right, has Medicaid coverage for that specific service, uh, rapid genome sequencing, um, uh, because of some of the really nice evidence about using these techniques to cut down the diagnostic odyssey. It's not 100% artificial intelligence, you know, but that's part of what can enable us to do the analysis much more quickly. Okay, and final, uh, uh, final question also from Aaron uh, on a similar note. How helpful can AI be when it comes to teasing out differential diagnoses? Could AI become more effective than diagnostic criteria in diagnosing rare diseases? Yeah, very short answer. Absolutely, yes. And one of the things that I didn't mention at all, you know, if you take a lot of people with rare diseases, it turns out that already we know that about five, three to five percent of them have more than one different genetic condition. So it's combining more than one different rare disease. And AI and other techniques are really good at teasing those out in ways that humans tend not to be as good at. Um, so short answer, yes, and there's a, there's a lot of potential there.